The world is dying. We are no longer at the top of the food chain. Cities have fallen to ruin as friends and neighbors transform into mindless predators. Faceless monsters guard the ruins, denying us the derelict remains of our past dignity. Humans are going extinct, and all of it, all of it, is because of this. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory, the fun guy who's here to talk about fun guy. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that time again. Time for the transmedia landscape to result in us talking about video games here on the Film and TV channel. That's because The Last of Us, just like Sonic, League of Legends, and Pokemon before it, is the latest in the line of games that's been turned into a fantastic movie or TV show. Take that, Game Theory! That's another piece from your toy box that's ours now. <laughs> Wait, am I, am I laughing at myself with this joke? I'm in charge of all of of these channels. What, what's going on here? In case you're not an elite gamer like all of us over here, let me catch you up. The Last of Us started its life in 2013 as a video game that set a new benchmark for cinematic storytelling in the medium. This story of a wounded man and his surrogate daughter trying to survive a world devastated by a zombie apocalypse immediately cemented itself as a pivotal piece of gaming history. The moment that gaming stood up and shouted, yes, we too can have emotional movie quality stories. Now, to be completely honest, gaming had already had plenty of other amazing stories in the past, but this was the moment when the visuals and the story both reached a point where no one could deny gaming's artistic properties anymore. The game was so good that Sony just had to release it on the PS3, and the PS4, and the PS5 again. All in under 10 years, no less. And here we thought rebooting movies happened quickly. Anyway, now here in 2023, the dramatic prestige video game has been turned into a dramatic prestige streaming series. In fact, as both top tier gamers and top tier movie nerds, Steph and I were lucky enough to get invited to the premiere. On that that note, this video is hashtag not spawn, but considering the amount of free popcorn that I ate that night, might as well have been. Oh, appropriate. Popcorn number two, exactly. Diet Coke number two, I am making them pay. For you this free premiere that we're at? Hey, you invite me to a place where I'm getting free, unlimited popcorn and Diet Coke? I am gonna make you hurt. So, after meeting some of the team who worked on the show, who also happen to be fans of food theory, that was a fun little twist, and then stealthing our way down the red carpet. Stephanie walking the black carpet, the private that black carpet, that we stealthily avoided. They're like, are you sure you don't want to walk the red no, carpet? Like, no thanks. I oh Jesus, because I literally break down the barrier. <laughs> it was time for the show. The first of the episodes. The last of us. Honest review, it's great. I get nervous whenever anyone tries to adapt such a perfectly told story, but I gotta admit, they nailed it. Sure, they made some changes to the source material, which we're gonna talk about here in a second, but it never detracted from the core story. So, with yet another series showing that the video game bad movie curse is not a real thing anymore, we finished by dancing the night away. You heard of the fun guy attack, but now comes the fun guy attack. <laughs> Though to be fair, we didn't party as hard as some. Don't be now, as you might have guessed at this point, the zombies in The Last of Us function a bit differently from your usual apocalyptic scenario. In most media, you're dealing with a blood-borne virus that's spread through bites, but not so much here. What makes The Last of Us so interesting is that it's all a fungus. In fact, the show spends its entire opening scene laying out why a fungal pandemic would be terrifying, using real science to lay out exactly what would happen. There's a fungus that infects insects, gets inside an ant, for example. The fungus starts to direct the ant's behavior, telling it where to go, what to do. So it begins to devour its host from within, replacing the ant's flesh with its own. The fungus this scientist is talking about is a real thing called cordyceps, which we've actually talked about multiple times over on the Sister Location Game Theory. It is terrifying stuff, but something that we shouldn't have to worry about, right? I mean, the show claims that fungal infections of this type cannot survive if its host's internal temperature is over 94 degrees. But then they ask, what if that changes? What if, for instance, the world were to get slightly warmer? Man, HBO sure loves you using zombie invasions as a metaphor for climate change, huh? Winter is coming. If only Westeros had reduced its greenhouse gas emissions. What's crazy, though, is how quickly things fall apart in the world of The Last of Us. Seriously, it basically felt like over the course of just a day or two, everyone everywhere all at once suddenly had their brains hijacked by a fungus like it was a five-star Grand Theft Auto rampage. Suddenly, zombie runners are in houses, in the streets, planes crashing out of the sky. What happened? And it's here that we actually get to one of the big differences between the game and the new series, as well well as our main theory for today. How did the fungus spread so quickly in the new HBO series, The Last of Us? You see, in the game, part of the reason the cordyceps were able to take control so quickly was through the use of spores. Like traditional zombies, the infected in The Last of Us game are able to spread infection to new people through bites, and this is true for the new series. There's this really great, horrifying shot where fungal tendrils are worming out of a woman's mouth to infect someone else. It is so gross. It was this moment that I'm like, yes, this series gets it. But in addition to munching on the living, the video game version
version of the cordyceps were able to infect new people through airborne spores produced in the bodies of the infected. And this creates a huge threat for all the survivors. There are big chunks of the game where our protagonist Joel has to wear a gas mask to survive. He even keeps one on him at all times just in case. So yeah, that's the way that you get this sort of rapid zombie spread if the show had airborne spores, but it doesn't. One of the show's creators, Craig Mazin, previously worked on the series Chernobyl for HBO, which had a ton of scenes with actors in hazmat suits and gas masks. Mazin found that it was more difficult to create drama when an actor's face was covered by a bunch of safety equipment. Hence, Joel's gas mask and the fungal spores having to go. I'm just Nope, no you're not, Stephanie. These babies are no longer airborne. Your dance is non-canonical. But if it's not spores, then what is it? What's causing the zombie fungus to spread? Surely there has to be some sort of an explanation, so I dived into behind-the-scenes information about the show, hoping to find some answers. And though I didn't find an explicit answer, what I found instead was a challenge. In the official HBO Max Last of Us post-episode podcast, they say this. By the way, a lot of little details are going to come back around. We don't want to give spoilers, but I will say this. Careful viewers of this episode will be rewarded repeatedly because little bits of breadcrumbs have been planted that are going to pay off later in interesting ways. Excuse me? Careful viewers, do you know who you're talking to? I've spent the last eight years pouring over every frame of movies and television that I've watched, overthinking, analyzing it. You challenge me to search, and I will find it. And you know what, loyal theorists? I did. I found the answer to how exactly this fungal parasite devastated the world so fast. And true to the creator's word, it was in the small details that were hidden in plain sight all along. How did the world of The Last of Us end? Cookies. Or more specifically, the flour that was used to bake those cookies. Allow me to explain. The first thing that tipped me off about flour is this line right here. In the background of one of the morning scenes, we can hear a radio broadcast that specifically talks about problems happening in Jakarta. Jakarta. Where is that, Middle East? It's in Indonesia, Joel. Learn some geography. Anyway, the call out of Jakarta immediately struck me as odd. Why there of all places? It seemed oddly specific. Well, in addition to beautiful beaches and tropical architecture, Jakarta also happens to be home to the largest flour mill in the world. This behemoth, run by P.T. Bogasari Flour Mills, has 15 milling lines. In fact, it's able to produce more than 4 million tons of flour each year. If this fungal infection spreads through flour products, of course, there's gonna be disturbances starting in Jakarta. Hey guys, this is a uh, future Matt Pet here. So this theory was written immediately after I saw the first episode, but uh, episode two actually gave us a little more information about the Jakarta situation in the show. That is very often the risk that we take when we do theories about ongoing series. Anyway, episode two's cold open takes place in Jakarta where a professor at the University of Indonesia is taking a look at one of the first infected people. We're told that this infected person came from quote, a flour and grain factory on the west side of the city. And then under her breath, the professor says, a perfect sub Substrate. A substrate, in case you don't know, is a surface or material where an organism, like say a fungus, can live, grow, and obtain nourishment. Basically, this practically confirms our theory that flour is the reason for the cordyceps outbreak in the show. So, woo, we got it right! That said, there's still a ton of fun evidence here in the episode, so I'm just gonna hand it back off to past MatPat now so you can keep watching and be impressed with how we solved this a week early and then release the video a week late. What's more, there are also tons of flour mills all over Texas. Texas, in Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, and yes, Austin, where the show's prologue takes place. With so many mills throughout Texas, the state would be a hot spot for an outbreak, just like we saw with Jakarta. But fungi and flour, is that scientifically reasonable? Flour is usually made from wheat or other grains, so how would a fungus get in there? Well, hate to say it, but you know mold, the gross stuff that grows on food that's spoiled or been left out for too long? That is a type of fungus, so if the wheat used to make it has gone bad in any way, there's likely some fungus mixed in there. Even fresh made flour out of mills has been shown to sometimes contain fungus. According to one study, there can be a ton of fungus inside of commercial flour. This study took 19 flour samples and 11 wheat samples from 11 different mills across Kansas, Nebraska, and the Pacific Northwest. In those samples, the fungal count in flour ranged from 85 to 8,100 per gram and between 90 and 1,400 per gram in the wheat. In both cases, spoilage of the product was not the source of the fungus. Stuff was just in there. So if a fungus can indeed be inside freshly milled flour somehow, why not cordyceps? So with me suddenly thinking that flour is sus, I rewatched the episode again. And immediately you see a bunch of 
of little details starting to add up. All throughout the prologue, we never once see Joel, Sarah, or Tommy eat anything flour-based, to the point where it's almost a miracle. In the morning, though Sarah's plan to make Joel pancakes, she can't because they don't have any more pancake mix. Where's the pancake mix? I was gonna make you birthday pancakes. After school, when Sarah visits their neighbor, Mrs. Adler, she turns down an offer to eat a cookie. Likely this is because they're raisin cookies, and raisins are just awful lies masquerading as chocolate chips, but still, this one move may have meant that Sarah missed a big old bite of zombie infection. Already, that'd be enough to raise some eyebrows, but the coincidences just keep going. That night, when Joel gets home late, they realize that he's forgotten to pick up the birthday cake that they were gonna share. Where's the cake? <sighs> Come on, man. I'll get us one tomorrow. And earlier in the day, they saw Mr. Adler feeding his elderly mother biscuits. In fact, when he offers some of the extras to Sarah and Joel, they decline. Joel even jokes that he loves biscuits. But I'm on Atkins. Atkins is, of course, a fad diet that recommends not eating any bread or grain products. Obviously, Joel isn't actually on Atkins here, given his plan to have pancakes and birthday cake. But it's still an interesting thing for the show to bring attention to, isn't it? Additionally, in the parts of the first episode set after the outbreak, we never actually see anyone eating any products made from flour. There's this big open crowd shot where we can't make out anyone's plates, and there isn't any bread scraps on Ellie's empty plate when she's being kept prisoner. Basically, the only thing that we see anyone consuming is Joel drinking some alcohol. In short, this show goes very far out of its way to never show us its main characters explicitly eating flour-based product. Hey, this is Future MatPat here again with some additional evidence that we see happening in episode 2. We do actually get someone eating bread during the present day. We see Ellie is eating a sandwich, which makes sense because she's immune to the zombie outbreak. And you notice what Joel and Tessa are eating? Jerky. No bread. Thought that was just another little detail that was worth pointing out. The only immune person is eating bread, while everyone else apparently isn't. Just cool little Easter eggs that I found while licking the wounds of this theory that came out too late. Curse you, extended editing pipeline! Now, I know what you're thinking. Wait, wouldn't the fungus just die off while being baked? And that's a really great thing to call out. Yes, according to the United States Department of Agriculture, most yeast and mold fungi are super sensitive to heat. Normally, they can be destroyed at temperatures of 140 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit, or 60 to 71 degrees Celsius. And most ovens, when they're baking cookies, are set somewhere between 325 and 350 Fahrenheit, or 163 to 177 C, well above those fungi killing temperatures. Even the most heat-resistant fungi in history, found in 2011 by scientists in India, can only survive temperatures of 239 degrees Fahrenheit, or 115 C. But all of that being said, fungi in the production lines of baked goods and bread products are still a massive problem. According to a study published in Food Research International, they actually found more fungus in goods after they'd been baked than anywhere else in the cooking process. Basically, they say that the highest fungal counts were seen in the final processing stages of making the goods, right after they'd come out of the oven and were busy cooling. And considering that The Last of Us spent that whole opening scene pointing out that the fungus in the world evolved to survive at higher temperatures, it's entirely plausible that the cordyceps made it out of the oven. And so now, with all of that in mind, I can't help but look back at the podcast that got me started down this rabbit hole to begin with. You know what I realized? The answer has been staring me in the face the entire time. Do you remember exactly what was said by the creators during that podcast? Careful viewers of this episode will be rewarded repeatedly because little bits of breadcrumbs have been planted. Breadcrumbs, huh? Like flour-based breadcrumbs? They told us the answer right there, those cheeky sons of a gun. And just to put the cherry on top here, the pièce de résistance. Do you know what they were talking about right before this in the podcast that got them to start talking about these little little hints, the intentional trail of breadcrumbs. We made a point of making this sort of joke about how she couldn't even eat biscuits. By the way, a lot of little details are going to come back around. We don't want to give spoilers. They were discussing the elderly neighbor, the first infected person we see, and how she was being fed biscuits. The evidence has mounted here, folks. The society of The Last of Us TV show fell apart because the cordyceps fungus evolved to be more heat resistant, to be able to take root in humans, and then its particles were spread worldwide through flour. So Joel, yes, he had plenty of reasons to say, You know, I don't really like pancakes. Your Atkins diet might be saving more than just your waistline. But hey! If you want to learn more about the evil fungus science behind this amazing story, check out our game theory talking about how Ellie isn't actually immune to the cordyceps infection. Or if you want more of a strategy guide on how to survive a post-apocalyptic wasteland, check out our video explaining why musicians would have the best chance of surviving a quiet place. As always, don't forget to take a big old bite out of that subscribe button so you never miss a new theory. There are a ton of great new movies and shows coming out this year that I can't wait to analyze alongside you guys. But until then, remember, it's all just a theory, a film theory, and cut.